Thank you very much, Devlin, for that time of singing together. Uh, you can, yeah, I don't have a text specifically this morning, so let me just bring you up to speed with what we've been doing so far. We have been covering a theme. The theme is your, the practical things you need for your sanctification, okay? We started with life habits, things that I want to term life habits because they ought to be part of your life as much as eating and drinking and sleeping. Those things are Bible reading, prayer, and fellowship, okay? Koinonia, or partnership, as we heard this morning. It's a, it's a wonderful word. Partnership is a better, better word, I think, is fellowship. Because fellowship has kind of lost its meaning. It's now become a thing that we... When we hear fellowship, we think we drink tea, tea together and we'll, we'll, you know, maybe visit, visit a little bit, have a friendship. Partnership is a better word. That's what the biblical picture is of the life habit that ought to be part of your life if you want to grow in Christ. Okay, so these three life habits are your fundamental things that need to be in place if you want to grow as a Christian. The picture that I've been using is Moses on the mountain with his hands lifted up and the two men helping him there and Israel in the valley fighting the war with Amalek. As long as what Moses' hands are up, they are fighting and they are winning the war. But when he drops his arms, okay, they're fighting but they're losing the war. What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, when Moses' hands are up, he's in prayer for the nation. And God's grace is given in the warfare, and they are winning the war. That is a wonderful picture of your Christian life. Christian, you are in a warfare in, with sin, and the world, and the devil. That war is only won by grace. God calls you to become like Jesus Christ. Right? That warfare can only be won by grace. And so, everything that I've been saying to you, these life habits, are, they are essential if you want to overcome in that battle. So, Moses' hands up, okay? That is a picture of your life habits, your prayer life your Bible reading, your Bible intake, and your partnership with other believers in the faith. Okay, If those things are not there, if they are being neglected, you're going to be in that war, whether you like it or not. You are called as a Christian to be in that war. Okay, But you're going to be losing. And I think all of you know what it's like to lose that warfare. Are you ever happy? Are you happy when you are overcome by sin? Are you happy? No, none of us are, okay? We are happiest when we are close to the Lord, when we are overcoming by grace. And so, these habits are vital if you want to overcome in that warfare. Now, last week I started with a, what I want to call it, I don't want to say the theology of, but it essentially is the theology of sanctification. What does the Bible teach about how we are sanctified? I've now given you three practical things that you can do. Something that you can go home with and you can actually start doing this. You can actually get into reading the Bible. Okay, Make that a life habit. You can get into praying. Make that a life habit. And partnership, fellowship with believers. Make that a life habit. Now I want to give you the theology, what the Bible teaches, how God has determined to sanctify you, to make you more like Him. We started last week by saying that we are called to become like Christ. In other words, when God called you out of the world, you became aware of your sin, of your sinfulness, of God's judgment upon your life, you became aware that if you died today, you were going to go to hell because there's sin in your life and you have no way of atoning for your own sin. What did you do? Well, someone shared with the gospel with you. Someone said that Jesus Christ has died for you. You believed the message. You confessed your sin. And through that, God gave you a new heart. 
Here's the essential thing that I said last week. The moment God did that, what was his, his aim, his goal? Okay? In Romans, we read that God calls us out of the world for what purpose? I'm going to read to you verse 29 of chapter 8. Those whom God foreknew, he also predestined for what purpose? To become conformed to the image of his son. Know this about yourself. That's God's goal with you. His goal is not to... Well, before I say that, I wanted to say his goal is not to make you, you know, happy, wealth, happy, happy, what is it? Wealth, help, and, wealth, health, and happiness, is it? What's that, uh, um, the theology of, of the um, health, wealth, and prosperity? There we go, okay? That's not his main goal. His main goal is to make you happy, okay? But the way God makes you happy is to make you like Christ. That's his main purpose. And now what the Lord does is he uses everything in your life. You're married, he's going to use your partner. You've got kids, he's going to use them. You're working, he's going to use that. Okay? Your life circumstances now become the crucible that he uses to accomplish this one purpose in you, to make you like Jesus. That's his goal. Now, Christian, if you know that, you've got to align yourself with the Lord and say, that's my goal as well. I want to be like Christ. I'm going to do everything I can in all of these situations that the Lord puts me to achieve that goal, to become like Christ. You know, that perspective is so powerful. When you go through trials, you're not going, Lord, what did I do wrong? Why are you angry with me? What can I do to make the trial stop? Rather, the question is, Lord, how can I become more like Jesus in this trial? If you want me to go through this trial, Lord, give me grace. Let me put my hands up like Moses, so that as I go through this trial, I'm becoming more like Christ. I'm not trying to run away and, you know, misinterpret God's intentions. God is not this tyrant that when you do something wrong, now he's going to hit you and discipline you and make you feel very awful. That's not his purpose at all. When he sends Job through the trial, it wasn't because Job did anything wrong. It was because God had an intention of conforming his son into his image. So, that's why we're going through these things. As I said last week, that's the goal. You remember that I also took you through the scriptures to show you that the Bible uses various uh, phrases, you know, ways of, of describing this goal, godliness, holiness, Christ-likeness. Um, we are to be conformed to the glory of God. And then I said, those are all various ways of saying the same thing, but I want to give you a practical thing. What does it look like to be holy? What does it look like to be Christ-like? What was the one word I gave you? God is love. Okay? If you want to be holy, learn, like Christ, to love your neighbor and to love God. If you want to be Christ-like, learn by grace to love your neighbor and to love God. Now, Paul says that the goal of our instruction is love. To teach people to love God and to love neighbor from a pure heart, a keen conscience, and a sincere faith. Now the question is, how do we practically get there? What does the Bible teach about how do we actually become like that? And it lays out a, shall I say, a a pattern. Okay, There's a pattern in the Bible, and I'm going to use this pattern as the outline for our time this morning and for next week. We're going to split this into two sermons. So the Bible teaches that the way we are sanctified, the way we become like Christ, the way that we learn to love our neighbor and to love God, 
It starts with knowledge. Knowledge leads to faith. Faith leads to heart change. And heart change ultimately leads to godly behavior. Okay? That's our outline. Those are the four points, if you will, that we're going to cover in the next two weeks. Two Sundays, Lord willing. This Sunday we'll look at knowledge and faith. And next Sunday, heart change and godly behavior. So, to summarize then, what we're doing this morning is, this is the practical pattern or steps, the practical steps that the Bible teaches that God takes you through. Now, you don't, you don't uh, graduate from knowledge into faith, right? And then you're done with knowledge. This is just the pattern that generally the Bible says, this is how God works. He, he opens your eyes, gives you knowledge. That knowledge wakens faith in your heart. You act faith, right, on God's promises and everything He says. That leads to a change in your heart. And that heart change leads to godly behavior. The difference here, compared to the way that perhaps, you know, shall we say, the Pharisees followed, the Pharisees would say, no, no, no. We don't think about heart change. We think about just simply clothing the outside, garbing the outside with the right behavior. We don't worry about the inside, right? And Jesus says, but that makes you like a grave. On the outside, you might look clean, but on the inside, you're dead men's bones. That's not good enough because God wants the heart to be changed. Okay? So, knowledge is the beginning point. Leads to faith leads to heart change, and leads to godly behavior. We're going to look at those four over the next two weeks. Father, as we look at your word, as what it teaches us concerning how you work with us, I pray that you will help us this morning understand your working with us, so that we can work with you towards this common goal of being more like you. Lord, we long to be like you. The Holy Spirit has caused us to yearn, hunger, and thirst for righteousness. But, O oh Lord, we are all very aware how we can silence the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we can get distracted and we can, get, we can fall into temptation and be hardened by the deceitfulness of our own hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you will deliver us from these failures, that you will forgive us and that you will cleanse us and help us as we learn more about what you are doing in us and the way you are accomplishing it, Lord, that we will truly become equipped to throw all our weight into this calling to be like you and that we may know the joy of your salvation truly as you have um, already on the cross given everything to accomplish it in us. And so we pray for this this morning. Amen. Right, so the first step or the first thing in this pattern that we see in the Bible, the way that God makes you more like Him, He starts with knowledge. It's the first step in a, shall we, shall we perhaps think about it this way. Knowledge, faith, heart change, behavior change. Okay, That is sort of a shall we say, a, a reinforcing circle. It keeps happening that way. Okay? So as your knowledge grows, your faith grows. As your faith grows, your heart change grows. As your heart change grows, your godly behavior changes. And that keeps happening over and over. But it starts with knowledge. Let me use your salvation as an example. Paul says in Romans 10, verse 13 to 14, Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the promise of the gospel. And then in verse 14 he says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard about? If people do not get the knowledge, understanding of Jesus, of what he did, how can they believe in him? So yes, your salvation started with knowledge. Somewhere, someone shared the gospel with you. And as they shared the gospel, and you understood, through the Holy Spirit, of, of course, knowledge led to the next step. You believed. You believed. You put your trust in what Jesus Christ has done. 
In other words, you needed to hear the gospel. You needed knowledge which came to you through the preaching of the gospel. And as you heard the gospel, the Holy Spirit opened your heart to believe the word and you acted faith on Christ and God's rich promises for your salvation. Now, in a similar way, sanctification, your growing to become more like Christ, progresses as knowledge deepens. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. What does Paul say there? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Let me start in verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And don't be conformed to this world. But what? Be transformed, that's sanctification, okay? How? By the renewing of your mind. Now the word mind there is the way you think. But think of it more in terms of your values, of your motives, of your, the things you love, right? The things you hate. Your convictions, your conscience, Sometimes, well, I can use myself as an example, right? When I came into the Christian faith, I had come from, shall I say, a very far place. It was very unchristian. My values and my convictions and my conscience was very, it was programmed with ungodly, worldly values, okay? Because I had lived in the world, I loved the world. I enjoyed living in the world. And then God saved me out of the world, and I had to be reprogrammed. Literally, my conscience had to learn, that's wrong, and this is right. Okay? When Paul says you have to be renewed in the attitude of your mind, he's talking about everything, not just it's the what, how you think, what you value, your motives, what you love, what you hate, why you do things. That's where sanctification comes from. That in itself, is a, in a sense, is sanctification. You are being conformed to think like Christ, to value what He values, to love what He loves, to hate what He hates. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22 and 23 says the same thing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. We're going to start. Let's start in verse 20. 20. Paul says to the Ephesians, but you didn't learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. That's that old person that used to love the world, that used to value what the world values, that used to be motivated by the things that the world is motivated by. Lay aside that old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of the seed, and that you be renewed, how? In the spirit of your mind. Again, Paul emphasizes the importance of your mind, your, your values, your convictions, your motives, the way you think. So, Christian, ignorance of the truth of the Word of God is a recipe for an impoverished spiritual life. Okay? I think you will all agree with me. If you don't know how God works with you, let me give you an example. As I said just now, some people don't understand that God's goal with them is to make them like Christ. And He uses their circumstances... Not because he's angry with them, but because he loves them. He takes you through hard things to shape you and form you and to make you like Christ. Okay? Sometimes he takes you through good things. You know, if I, I don't want to just say if, as if God only uses the hard things. He uses good things as well. His blessings and all of the things are things that he uses to be, make you like Christ. But some Christians don't understand that. 
They think, well, you know, if something's wrong in my life, it's because I must be doing something wrong and God is angry with me. And then they, you know, they want to... Well, yeah, I, don't want, I, don't want the, I don't want the hits anymore, Lord. How can I make it stop? And then they go on, like, you know, night visuals and praying and, you know, kind of um, introspection and trying to figure out what they can do to make the suffering stop. They miss. They miss the opportunity they have. Because they don't understand. Knowledge is important. Knowledge is important. Knowledge is understanding who God is. Understanding what He does for you. Understanding what He's called you to be and to do. That's why I say again, ignorance, ignorance of the biblical truth is a recipe for an impoverished, impoverished life. In fact, in Ephesians 4 verse 18, Paul says that unbelievers are excluded from the life of God. Why? Because of their ignorance. They don't know. They don't know. I think we could draw a parallel to say this is in one sense true for Christians as well. You will be excluded from the life of Christ in you, that joy of knowing His power at work in you, if you don't know, if you're ignorant. So knowledge is crucial for your growth. I want you to be aware of the fact that knowledge is of two kinds, right? You've got factual knowledge and experiential knowledge. I'm going to use... Uh, just simple relationships, uh, um, just your relationship with someone else is going to be a good analogy here. Factual knowledge is knowing and understanding, shall we say, propositional truth about God. Okay? Or perhaps you get to meet someone, knowledge, you, you sit down at the table and they give you a bunch of information about themselves. Okay? And now you have knowledge about them. This is the same. The Bible tells you a lot about God. You get to know a lot about Him that way. That's factual knowledge. It's knowing and grasping what God has said in His Word. Or to use Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it is beholding the glory of God in the Word of God. This knowledge lays the groundwork for understanding why you read and study and memorize the Bible. Okay? This is why we lay emphasis on this life habit. This is where you get to know Him. This is where you pick up that factual knowledge. If you neglect the Word of God, you are going to be a poor Christian. Think of Bible intake as watering the garden. Just like plants depend on the water... So the vigor of your spiritual life depends on your Bible intake. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. We've gone to this text quite a lot. James chapter 121 says the same, but I'm going to take you just to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Peter says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, that's the old life, put it aside... Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Your factual knowledge of God is crucial if you want to grow in your sanctification. You've got to know who He is. You've got to know what He's like, how He works with you. It is nearly impossible, I'm not, you know, nearly impossible to try and interpret your circumstances. People try and do that sometimes. They try and interpret, they take their circumstances and then try and interpret what God is saying to them, or what God is trying to do, okay? That is so difficult. <laughs> Generally how it works is you'll only know what God wanted to do when you look back in your life, Okay? But as you go through the trial, it's like Job. Job just did not understand what God was doing. And he, God didn't give him an answer. 
Like you're going to cry out and God just going to, you know, you're not going to get an answer. What you need is the word. That is objective truth that, you know, it doesn't change. And it's not an interpretation. It's not like you're going, you know, the situation that you're trying to interpret, you're going, I think it's that. No, with the Bible you can say, I know, this is what God is like. Then I take that knowledge to my circumstance and I say, okay, Lord, I don't exactly know what your intention is, where we're going with this, but I know this is what you're like. I can trust you. That's what I hold on to. Your knowledge is crucial. Now, I know I lay a lot of emphasis on Bible intake, Bible reading, listening to good preaching, being part of a sound church, Um, especially with Bible reading. I've heard people push back on this by saying that we shouldn't be so legalistic about Bible reading. I know it can get there. It can become a legalistic issue. We don't want it to be that. But people who say that generally don't understand the importance of the Bible in their Christian life. Okay? The reason I lay, I often say, if you want to do Bible reading, start at the beginning and end at the end, right? Don't use the Bible like, like a little butterfly that goes from, from, from plant, uh, like from, from, uh, you know, flower to flower. There we go. Like, to this, tonight I'm going to open the Bible and I'll go, oops. Okay, I'm going to read and then I'll go like, okay, now I'm tired, I'm done. Okay? And tomorrow night, just because my conscience says I have to read, I'm going to go, oops. And then I'll go, okay, okay. That's not going to be helpful. That's not going to be helpful if you want to build a knowledge of who God is. You need to be in the Word, okay? Another thing that I, I'm aware that people do is they would take, um, you've got these little uh, helps that that's, you know, some preachers have written where you take a verse and then you have a little duck sticky. What's that called in, in English? Devotional, there we go. You've got devotional books. They're great. Okay? I'm not saying don't do that, but that is not Bible reading. Okay? That's not going to help you grow. That's like, you know, sometimes, I don't know, I, I've never myself used those things. So, you know, maybe that helps you in some sense, and that's great. But do not substitute Bible reading with a devotional. Right? Devotional is going to give you one text and it's generally not in the, you don't really know what the context is and you get some you know some lesson that's going to help you for a moment there's value in that the lord saved my wife through a devotional okay the lord opened her eyes to the gospel through a devotional so praise the lord for that i'm not saying that devotions are bad but that's not bible intake okay bible intake is you're in this word for yourself nobody's reading for you you're in the Word. You are not, you know, don't think, well, okay, my husband's reading, so I don't have to do it. Or, you yeah, will read at church, so I don't have to do it. Okay? You need to be in the Word. You need to be in the Word so that you can get to know the Lord. So, no, it's not a legalistic thing. We lay emphasis on it because essentially this is vital if you want to overcome in the valley. Right? This is one of those things. Bible reading, if you drop your hands, you're going to be weak. I think I want to say something else also in this context of factual knowledge. Building up a body of knowledge of who God is. The, the Lord has given the church many, many faithful men who have written, okay, and written good books that have, that have spiritual insight that they have now made available for you to make use of, okay? We have a library at the back there, and obviously there's a gazillion more books out there that you can find. Just make sure that they are drink from the sound streams, streams that you know are healthy, okay? But there are many books out there. I have been blessed by so many of these men that, that I've read. Some of their books that one I can mention now is um, John Piper, for example. Okay? Wonderful. 
uh, MacArthur, we've all you know, been blessed by with some of his books. Some of the Puritans, you, you just read Flavel, I think it was, John Flavel. You know, those are vital because they help you delve deep into one subject okay, and give you light on that subject. Don't neglect those. Make some time for them. Don't substitute Bible reading for that or that for Bible reading, okay? Excuse me, don't substitute that for Bible reading. You can substitute that for Bible reading for that, okay? But my point is just that make time for those because those are as valuable to give you insight and knowledge, the knowledge that leads to sanctification. Now there's factual knowledge, but then there's also experiential knowledge. And the reason I want to get to this is because you need to be aware of the fact that your experiential knowledge of God takes time. When you got married or you, you know, got into a relationship with, with your spouse, your future spouse even, you know, you might not be married yet, but you're in this relationship, that, the knowledge of that person took time. And the longer you are in that relationship with with them, the better you get to know them. Why? Because now you get experiential knowledge. You didn't just sit around the table and say, you know, I like blue and, you know, I like, this is my favorite meal. And you've got a bunch of data points about the person. No, now you've actually spent some time with them. You've seen them in different situations. You've got experiential knowledge about them. Right? Now you know them on a different level, don't you? And I believe the longer you do that, the more you guys become alike. So much so that sometimes, you know, when a couple have been together that long, they actually sort of look like each other, right? But it's nice. The Lord made us like that. That's wonderful. That's experiential knowledge. That takes time. Be aware that your Bible intake is not like a booster that's going to, you know, make you like Christ all of a sudden. No. That coupled with experiential knowledge, coupled with time, is how you are growing. Experiential knowledge takes time. Our relationship with the Lord is something that we take time with. We deepen in our knowledge of Him through experiencing His care for us. And I think of Israel. Israel deepened in their understanding of God by walking with Him through the desert. Remember, when they were in Egypt, they had a promise. There's a, God promised Abraham and he, to give him this land, and we are going to go there sometime. Okay? But they had no idea of the power of God, of the, the ability of God to, to change their situation from something terrible to the kind of victory that they experienced. And so God comes to them and He calls them out of Egypt... And then he starts to lead them all the way to the promised land. The 40 years that they spent in the desert, okay, and everything that God did for them gave them experiential knowledge so that when they go into the promised land, they have got a base of knowledge to trust God. But without those that time, they wouldn't have known him that way. It took time. It took 40 years. Our, God, our knowledge of God is enriched and deepened as we experience His care for us. And this obviously implies that we have to be patient. We have to be patient. That longing to know the Lord is sometimes so strong that we can be impatient. But Paul clearly says that we are changed into the same glory of the Lord incrementally. That means, he says, we are changed from glory to glory, and that happens. Think of a a watch, right? The second arm going tick, tick, tick. It happens over a lifetime. As you are walking with the Lord, He's going to be changing you. So be patient. You must be patient and faithful as you pursue the knowledge of God. So, knowledge is the first step the first element in the way that God changes you. You need to be engaged in Bible reading, Bible intake. You need to be engaged in reading good, um, faithful books by people who know the Lord and have themselves 
experienced his grace. That knowledge leads to faith. Faith is the second element in the progression of your sanctification. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 indicates that we were born again through the word of God. This means that we heard the word preached or somehow someone shared the word of God with you and then something mysterious happened. You believed the message. And as you believed the message, God did something wonderful in your heart. He changed you. The Holy Spirit opened your eyes to see Christ and He awoke faith in your heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, I'm not going to turn there. The Bible says, God shines light into our hearts so that we may see the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words, there was a long time in my life where I knew that Jesus died on the cross. Okay, I could give you those facts. But it had nothing to do with me. I just remember my grandfather always telling me, Jesus died for you, Jesus died for you. Okay? But there came a moment in my life where someone shared the gospel with me and I was under the conviction of sin. I knew if I died and I stood before the Lord, I would be condemned. Period. Okay? And the moment he shared the gospel with me, the message I had heard so many times, my eyes were opened and said, but I'm going to die for my sin, and I, now I understand why Jesus died on the cross, so that I could receive forgiveness. And I saw the glory of God in the face of Christ. I saw the love of God, something I'd never seen before. I saw, but God loves me, that terrible, hell-deserving sinner. And I could call out to him for the first time in my life because I knew he died for me. Okay? Okay? That's what it's like when your eyes are opened. You may not have had the same experience as me. You may have been good. You know, you came out of a Christian home, and you, but you had a religion, not a, re, a relationship with God. Okay? And somewhere, something happened that your eyes were opened to the glory of God in the face of Christ, and you began to love Him. You began to cherish Christ. Something, you know... The Lord opened your eyes to understand, but you are as good as what you are. You're still a sinner. You need grace. That's what brought you to the cross. That's what helped you cry out to God. You see, God mediates His blessings to us through His Word and in answer to your faith. So I said knowledge leads to faith. What is faith? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a definition and then I'm going to wrap up for us. And then I'll carry on next week. Okay? Turn with me to, if, uh, to Hebrew chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. What is faith? Faith today in many places is defined as Leverage, thank you very much. I don't know why that happens. Anyway, faith is defined as leverage. In many places, faith is defined as faith is the thing that I use to get God to do what I want. Faith is the thing I, I use to make God give me what I want. So if I want, to be, I want, if I want something, I've got to believe really hard and I'll ask God and then He's going to give it to me. Okay? Leverage. That's not the biblical definition of faith. What is faith? Faith, says the Bible, verse 1 in chapter 11 of Hebrews, is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. It is super important that you understand that definition in the context of the letter. Okay? Question, what are the things hoped for and what are the things not seen in the context? Well, if you turn over the page in chapter 11, he's going to give you a list of names, Moses, 
Enoch, Ab- uh, no- Noah, Abraham, uh, David, la- later on Isaac, Jacob, Rahab, all of these people in the Bible. And he says, they had something that they hoped for. They had something that they, they were convicted of. It's going to happen, but they hadn't received it yet. They couldn't see it yet. Okay? Where did they receive that something? God came to Abraham and said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to take you out of your country. I'm going to put you into a new country. I will give you that land. I'm going to do it. I'm going to settle you there. Not only that, I'm going to give you a son, and through that son, we're going to create a nation, and they will possess this land. God gave Abraham a promise. What was it that Abraham was looking forward to? The promise of God. What was he hoping for? The promise of God. The word of God. You go through this list in chapter 11, that's the common factor between all of these people. Every single one of them, God gave them a promise. Faith is believing what God has promised you. Okay? Faith is believing what God has promised you. So, if you don't know what God has said to be and to do for you in the Word, you can't have faith. I don't know what you call that other thing that people do, but that's not faith. Faith is believing what God has said about Himself. Believing what God has promised to do for you, to be for you. Believing what God has warned you about. You know, when I warn my kids, don't do that because I've been down that road and it's a bad ending. Don't do that. Okay? I want them to say, I believe you, Dad, and I'm not going to go down the road. Okay? That's what God does with these warnings. It's like, don't do that. Sin, we teach our kids, sin brings pain. Why? Because God says, sin brings pain. Believe that. Faith is believing God. It's as simple as that. The thing that they were hoping for, the thing that they were convicted of, was what God had promised them. So, knowledge leads to faith. Can you make the connection now? You can't have faith unless you know what God has said. Right? Knowledge now can lead to faith. Now I can trust the Lord. Now I can believe Him. And how do we know that we believe and trust Him? Faith expresses itself in, I'm going to say, I'm going to include prayer and obedience. Okay? It's as simple as that. If I tell my son, don't do that. It's going to be bad for you. How do I know he believes me? Well, he he obeys. He doesn't do it. If I tell my boy, you know, go down this road because it's a good road and you'll be blessed there. How do I know he believes me? He's going to do what I tell him. It's as simple as that. Okay? How do you know that you believe God? Well, look at your obedience. Are you actually doing what he says? Do you trust him? Are you acting faith on what he has promised to be and to do for you? You cannot have faith unless you have knowledge. These two go hand in hand. And the deeper your knowledge of God, experiential and factual, right? The deeper your knowledge of God, the deeper your faith becomes. Oh, Job was a very different person after the trial than before. After the trial, he had experiential knowledge of God that he did not have before the time. And he could go, th- well, he could now face life with a new faith. Faith that says, you know what? God is far more amazing than I thought he was. Far more. And even though I don't see what he's doing, I can trust him. Paul says we live by faith, not by sight. Okay? We don't live by you know, taking our circumstances and saying, oh, God must be angry with me because things are not going well. No. We live by faith. What does the Bible say about God? That's what I believe in my circumstances. We live by faith, not by sight. So knowledge 
leads to faith. Now next week I want to expand a little bit more on this faith element and then I want to take you into the fact that faith leads to heart change and then heart change leads to godly behavior. Father, we thank you that you have given us the word. We thank you that the Holy Spirit, whom you have sent into our hearts and who has sealed us for the day of redemption, that he opens the eyes of our hearts to behold your glory, to get to know you in the word. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to deepen our conviction of these realities, of the way that you, well, first of all, of what you have called us to, to become more like Christ. And secondly, of the way in which you do it, Lord, I pray that you will help us not just think of these life habits as, you know, kind of things we do, Lord, but they are essential to and vital for our spiritual growth. And I pray that you will help us take hold of that truth so that when we become lazy, when we become distracted, when we become uh, led astray because of perhaps sinful desires or, or just whatever happens, you know, the busyness of life, Lord, that we will be able to grab hold of ourselves and bring us back to the, to the, to the anchor that helps us grow to the scriptures, to fellowship or, or f- a partnership with, with the other believers and to prayer. And I pray this, Lord, so that we may enjoy you and so that we may know the joy of your salvation and glorify you in all that we do. Amen.